Hello everyone and thank you for joining me for this presentation today. Uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to come forth and to share a little bit of my research uh, that I've been working on over the past couple of years with, uh, with everyone. Uh, to start, my name is Miles Stanley and I'm a second year PhD student at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. And uh, before we begin, of course, I, I would like to thank my university, uh, my advisors, Frank Cogliano and David Silkenet, uh, as well as my very generous benefactor, Mr. Simon Fennell, uh, who, without, who's, uh, without his generous um, funding, I, I could not carry on this important research uh, that I am sharing with you today. And uh, of course, I would uh, like to extend a, a very heartfelt thank you to Delaware's Historical and Cultural Affairs Office uh, and all of the absolutely fantastic work that they do uh, and also for the opportunity to, uh, to speak with, with everyone today. Um, thank you, thank you so very much. Um, also, uh, I, I, I could not go on uh, were it not for the extraordinary effort and work of all of the historians who have written on Delaware's history before me. Uh, those historians in particular, uh, I would like to give a, an, uh, a very warm thank you to Patience Essa, William Williams, Jane Calvert, and the eminent Gary Nash. Thank you all for, for all that you've done um, and uh, for all of the different ways that you have benefited scholars of the Mid-Atlantic and, and uh, and Delaware in particular. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. So, as I mentioned earlier, what I'm sharing with you today, uh, that this talk is is just a small piece of a, of a much larger project that's connected to my my uh, PhD research, and um, which, which which broadly um, looks at how enslaved Black families transitioned to uh, freedom between 1780, 1790 and roughly 1830. Um, so this section uh, entitled A Mere Mock Freedom uh, looks in particular at, uh, at anti-slavery activity in Delaware, uh, particularly the passage of, of a couple of several, several different laws in the 1780s and 1790s that were meant to, uh, I, I should say, reduce um, the impact of slavery and control the spread of slavery um, during that period, and then the subsequent response from uh, pro-slavery-minded Delawareans, uh, particularly in the passage of uh, laws that targeted the rights of what was a, a growing, a quickly growing free free black population within the state of Delaware. Um, so, so I'd like I'd like to start uh, with the with the story that really sparked my interest in this particular avenue of of research. Um, and, uh, and it goes a little, little something like this here. So in 1837, the American Anti-Slavery Society sent William H. Yates to the state of Delaware in search of a story. And these are a few of the more uh, notable members of the American Anti-Slavery Society. Its founder, William Lloyd Garrison, Susan B. Anthony, uh, as well as Frederick Douglass here pictured. Uh, Yates, a, a formerly enslaved free black reporter for the American Anti-Slavery Society, was charged with assessing and reporting on the condition uh, of Delaware's free blacks. Uh, Yates quickly discovered that this would be no easy task uh, as, the, uh, as the number of free blacks within the state of Delaware had increased nearly fourfold over the previous 50 years. Uh, between roughly 1790 and, and 1840. And by 1840, in fact, Delaware's free black population comprised nearly one quarter, 22% uh, in reality, of the state's total population. So even with Delaware's close connection to northern states and the large number of free blacks that resided within the state itself, Yates noted the dire conditions experienced by Delaware's black population in 1837. Quote, strange as it may seem, Yates stated in his report, there is an extensive and moral fear of colored people pervading the community. In his report to the, uh, to the, AA, uh, the American Anti-Slavery Society, uh, Yates documented how free blacks in Delaware inhabited a kind of a liminal position uh, between slavery and, and freedom. 
by, by 1837. And here we can see this is the beginning of Yeats's report, uh, pictured on the right-hand side, which was published in uh, the New York uh, newspaper, The Colored American, um, subsequently uh, was also published in, in other anti-slavery uh, magazines and newspapers as well uh, during that period. Yates's report quoted the former senator, Thomas Clayton, who during his lifetime also spoke out against the dire conditions that free blacks experienced within Delaware. Clayton wrote that, quote, under the wretched and mongrel system of laws which have been enacted in regard to them, they enjoy but a mongrel liberty, a mere mock freedom. Yates concluded that because of this, Delaware's free blacks were, quote, newly, n truly neither slaves nor free, being subject to the many disabilities and disadvantages of both conditions and f enjoying few of the benefits of either. So these are uh, some of the other aspects of, of Yeats's report. Um, it was a two, I believe, it was printed over the course of two uh, issues of the of the Colored American. Um, and uh, so I, Yeats's report really got me thinking. Um, how could a state that had such a close connection to Pennsylvania and other northern increasingly anti-slavery minded states, a state which seemed almost destined in and of itself to pass a gradual abolition act, have taken so many steps backwards in regard to the rights of or regarding the rights of, of free blacks? And perhaps most importantly, how did free and enslaved black people carve out their lives in a state that offered them little more than mere mock freedom? And what I'm finding is that the legislative assault on slavery in the early 1780s and 1790s in, in the state of Delaware very quickly became an assault on the rights that, on the few rights that free blacks maintained. And in the early 19th century, uh, as, uh, as more and more of Delaware's uh, black population gained their freedom uh, and began to exercise their mobility as well as their right to own property, which was one of the few rights uh, that free blacks maintained in this period, pro-slavery-minded Delawareans began to impose this wretched, quote, wretched and mongrel system of laws that, that Yates wrote of in, in 1837. And here, and we're going to talk about this throughout today, we can see uh, the, the demographic shifts that are happening during this 50-year period that we're, that we're discussing today. Um, see the rise of the free black population and the decline of the enslaved black population there. So today we're going to look at this, and these are some of the questions that I've laid out to help, uh, to help drive this talk and to give us some clear, uh, clear targets for what we're going to be discussing today. Um, they, they're always helpful. So, uh, first of all, what did anti-slavery activity look like in Delaware? How was this countered by pro-slavery activity within the state? What were the specific laws that targeted the rights of the free black community that I mentioned earlier? And how did these laws impact the lives of free blacks in Delaware? And then, of course, perhaps most importantly, why study Delaware in the late 18th and early 19th centuries? Um, and, uh, and hopefully by the time we, we get through this, uh, you will have a, a good glimpse of, of what my research is hoping to accomplish. Um, and uh, to start, I think it's probably best if I answer the last question first, and then we're going to run through them uh, in order. So that, uh, that last question, why study Delaware between eight, roughly 1780 and, and 1840? Uh, so this, this period is often referred to uh, as the early republic. And during this period of the early republic, the mid-Atlantic region in particular experienced an extraordinary amount of changes. Delaware sat at the threshold to what was increasingly becoming known as the Free North and the, and the Slave South uh, during this period uh, in, in America. And this state provides a very unique case study of just how the, the choices made by a relatively small amount of people can indeed impact a nation. So I've been talking about anti-slavery activity in the state of Delaware. Uh, at the close of the 18th century. What exactly did that look like? Um, in particular, how, what did that look like in relation to other um, anti-slavery activity in, in other northern states? 
And I mentioned that gradual abolition was was a popular trend in other northern northern <clears throat> excuse me other northern states. Um, so in 1780, uh, Pennsylvania passed North America's first Gradual Abolition Act, uh, followed by Connecticut, Rhode Island, New York, and New Jersey, as we can see on this uh, chart here. Uh, Vermont entered uh, as a free state. Um, so there was no need for a pl place like Vermont to, to pass a Gradual Abolition Act. Um, but uh, I think for the sake of this talk, is probably most most beneficial if we look at how gradual abolition impacted the lives of enslaved blacks uh, in in Delaware's immediate neighbor of Pennsylvania, the northern neighbor of of Pennsylvania. And so, some important aspects of Pennsylvania's Gradual Abolition Act uh, was uh, was this, or were were, were these the. Um, so first of all, any uh, any enslaved person um, born after March of 1780, which was when the law passed, um, was freed on their 18th birthday if they were a female, or 20 21st birthday uh, if they were if they were a male. Um, so those are those are important uh, dates to remember: 18 and 21, uh, and then. Secondarily, another probably the most important aspect of this uh, of this act is that any child born to a woman while she remained enslaved, so that is prior to her 18th birthday, uh, any child born remained enslaved until the, their 18th or 21st birthday. Um, so as you can see, this is a very, very gradual process, uh, a very, very slow march towards freedom, taking generations uh, for 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 families throughout. Uh, uh, Pennsylvania. Um, also, I think an important part of Pennsylvania's Gradual Abolition Act is that it gave free black people in Pennsylvania the right to vote. Um, and uh, this is this is important to uh, to remember. So if gradual abolition was a popular trend in northern states, um, let's look at let's look at what Delaware chose or what path Delaware chose to pursue. John Dickinson's, or, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Delaware's own John Dickinson uh, <laughs> drafted a gradual uh, abolition act in the uh, in the mid 1780s, which was really a toned down version of Pennsylvania's act. It was heavily heavily based on on Pennsylvania's act. Um, but the the uh, the act written uh, drafted by Dickinson uh, did not receive the uh, the required amount of of votes. Um. So I, I said it was a toned down version, a more conservative version of the uh, of the Pennsylvania Act, um, which was in and of itself a, a relatively conservative uh, gradual abolition act when you compare it to other northern states and their gradual abolition acts. Um, let's look at at why that is. Um, so uh, uh, first of all, I think it's very interesting that um, Dickinson removed what was a uh, a preamble from the Pennsylvania Act that contained all of these wonderful flourishes of uh, linguistic flourishes in a, in a sort of a fiery condemnation of slaveholding. Um, and uh, uh, John Dickinson removed all of that. Um, and he and he wrote in his notes that he uh, did not want to insult anyone with any sort of fiery condemnations of slaveholding. Um, Interestingly, the proposal for Delaware did not contain any voting rights for free blacks, uh, which was a highly contested point of the uh, 1780 Pennsylvania uh, Gradual Abolition Act. Um, so if they didn't, if Delaware did not pass gradual abolition, then what happened in Delaware? What, what was the anti-slave, what was the... Uh, anti-slavery, or I'm sorry, assault on slavery uh, in the state of Delaware. What did that, what did that look like? Well, it was focused around manumission and the criminalization of exportation of enslaved people. So instead of, instead of gradual abolition, legislators passed a series of laws that criminalized the sale of enslaved people both into and out of the state of Delaware, and also made it easier 
to voluntarily manumit enslaved people within the state. Um, and it's going to be very important moving on to remember that manumission is, is not like gradual abolition in that manumission is a totally voluntary act. It is not a state mandated uh, uh, act where, as in, in Pennsylvania, um, enslaved females gained their freedom at the age of 18, males at 21. Um, and another, another important thing to remember is that in Delaware, manumissions, as, as elsewhere, manumissions uh, were often highly conditional and contained extensive terms of enslavement that were laid out uh, even after a manumission deed was, cre was created. Um, so, so keep in mind that very few uh, enslaved Delawareans gained their freedom through manumission before their mid to late 20s, um, you know, particularly b before the age of 30, I think it would be safe to say. Um, so let's look at these laws, these manumission and exportation laws in detail to get a better picture of, of what the anti-slavery movement in the state of Delaware looked like. So in 1787, we have uh, the passage of an act prohibiting the exportation of slaves and for other purposes, which is pictured here on the left-hand side, left, right, right, left. Um, I have trouble with left and right sometimes. Um, on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, let's see, which that criminalized the sale of enslaved Delawareans uh, to the Carolinas, Georgia, and the West Indies, and attached a fine of 100 pounds to any convictions. Um, now in 1789, which is not pictured, there was a supplement attached to the 1787 law, which criminalized the outfitting of slave ships in, the, in Delaware's ports with a, with a fairly substantial fine, um, and also criminalized the sale of enslaved people from Delaware into Delaware's neighbors of Maryland and Virginia. Um, it did increase the fine by, I believe it was 20 pounds per instance of trafficking, um, but still, uh, this law is relatively toothless. There are no physical punishments uh, provided for anyone convicted of this, uh, of this illicit traffic. Um, and it's not until 1793, um, which is the law that we see uh, on the on the right hand side, an act to punish the practice of kidnapping, uh, where physical punishments are attached to any convictions of uh, of anyone who's convicted of, of uh, exporting illicitly exporting um, any enslaved peoples out of the state of Delaware. And what this meant was is that anyone convicted uh, after 1793 risked uh, 39 lashes, well laid on. And then afterwards, they were forced to, quote, stand in the pillory for the space of one hour with both his or her ears nailed thereto, and at the expiration of the said hour, to have the soft part of their ears cut off so as to mark their uh, involvement um, in, the, uh, in the trade. Now, as I mentioned, these weren't just exportation acts. They also... Um, they also helped to regulate manumissions, which prior to 1787, there had been conflicting manumission laws. The legal status of manumitted people uh, was sort of questioned. Um, there was no um, outline for how to fill out a manumission deed, um, what pertinent information needed to be included. So these laws also cleared up uh, uh, any sort of questions regarding the legal status of manumitted people. Um, which is which is important to, to remember as well. Now, these these extensive manumissions had a powerful impact on the growth and development of the free black community in Delaware during this period. And uh, this is, of course, as both uh, black and white anti-slavery activists applied these new laws. Um, Throughout the, uh, the 1780s and, and 1790s in Delaware, uh, white anti-slavery activists, who were led primarily by members of the Society of Friends, also known as Quakers, uh, petitioned the state's uh, legislators and pressured their neighbors uh, into the, pressured their neighbors regarding the importance of manumission. Um, here on the uh, on the left hand side, uh, we have a great biography by Gary Nash of the Quaker abolitionist uh, Warner Mifflin. 
So activists like Warner Mifflin, uh, whom historian Gary Nash called, quote, a one-man abolition society on the Eastern Shore, continually petitioned legislators to pass a gradual abolition act. Uh, he also continually petitioned to enforce the laws that were already on the books. Uh, can, uh, so there, there's, there is a lot of evidence that these laws were not uh, enforced regularly. Um, so he petitioned the legislators, and uh, he also uh, traveled door to door, very literally door to door, to his neighbors uh, and and counseled them on the necessity of manumitting those that they uh, that they enslaved. And when he wasn't doing either of these things, uh, when he was at his home in Kent County, Delaware, uh, he acted as a station master on the Underground Railroad and aided um, enslaved blacks as they as they passed through uh, through his home in in uh, in Kent County. Um, and over here on the on the right hand side, this picture here uh, is the site of the former uh, Motherkill Monthly Meeting House, a Quaker meeting house and cemetery, um, which is off of a highway that doesn't have a pull off in uh, in Kent County. It 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 is the final resting place of Warner Mifflin, um, and uh, so so at the same at the same time as these white anti slavery activists are. Uh, applying pressure to not only pass new legislation, but to enforce the legislation that's already on the books. Um, enslaved blacks are using their knowledge of these new laws and their connections to some of the nation's first uh, abolition societies to sue for and to win their freedom uh, through what were called freedom suits. Uh, when when those that uh, enslaved them, when those who enslaved them uh, violated any of these new laws. So for example, on October 22nd, 1790, four enslaved black men named Abraham, Edward, William, and Rainey sued for their freedom after they were illegally transported from Maryland into Delaware. The, uh, the defendant, Dr. Slider Bouchel, claimed that, quote, he was altogether ignorant of any laws whatsoever forbidding the bringing of slaves into the state under any circumstances. And he pleaded, uh, to uh, prevent, quote, the loss of said slaves. Now, these laws, the 1787, 1789, and 1793 laws, uh, did provide legal avenues to legally transport enslaved people both into and out of the state of Delaware. Uh, they required various signatures of various numbers of justices of the peace, uh, a time-consuming process, um, they required money, and it was meant to. It was a deterrent. Um, it was an, uh, it intended to stop the spread of slavery uh, into, both into and out of the state of Delaware. Um, however, many, many slave owners just simply claimed ignorance. Uh, however, I find the story in particular uh, fascinating since clearly uh, Edward, Abraham, William, and Rainey possessed no such ignorance of the, uh, of the law. And uh, during, the, uh, during the trial, Dr. Bushell raged that the young men had, quote, been instigated by some officious persons to apply to their freedoms. Um, yeah, the yeah, pesky anti-slavery advocates um, looking to enforce laws um, and prevent such uh, transgressions. Uh, so these, uh, these laws and their application uh, by both uh, white and black anti-slavery advocates uh, resulted in the expansive growth of the free black population during this period. Um, and as we've seen before, um, you know, it, it is a, a considerable growth of the free black community up to 22% in 1840 uh, and a decline in the enslaved population. But even as anti-slavery activism is ramping up in the state, so too is heavily racialized pro-slavery rhetoric. And, uh, and during this period, we see more and more petitions uh, from white pro-slavery Delawareans that demand new laws to control what they saw as the, quote, evil example of idle and slothful free blacks. Um, as, as a sort of an aside, um, the language of, of uh, the evil influence of, quote, idle and slothful free blacks um, is nothing new to these pro-slavery-minded Delawareans during this period. Uh, in fact, there were laws on the books as early as 1740 that contained this language. Um, however, as the free black community grows, 
uh, during this period, these these uh, these notions these st are, are are certainly being reinforced. Um, and uh, it's important to note that let me get out the laser pointer here that uh, these pro-slavery voices are primarily uh, coming out of Sussex County, the southernmost county here pictured in red. Um, the it's the agricultural rural agricultural. Uh, county in uh, in Delaware. So even as these petitions uh, are, uh, these pro-slavery uh, voices are becoming louder um, throughout the 1780s and 90s, no real meaningful legislation is passed um, that, uh, that, that comes down on, on free black rights in the state. Uh, indeed, it wasn't until 1811 that lawmakers passed some of the most detrimental legislation uh, that targeted the rights of free blacks within the state. Excuse me. So, as I said, it's not until 1811. And uh, here on the left-hand side, we see the 1811 Act to prohibit the emigration of free Negroes and mulattoes. Now, this act, uh, rather extraordinarily, stipulated that free blacks from outside of Delaware were not allowed to enter the state to live and that any non-resident free black would be fined $10 for every week that they remained within the state. Now, shockingly, non-payment of, uh, of these fines uh, resulted in, in re-enslavement, quote, and I'll read from the law here, for such term as shall be sufficient for payment of said fines and costs, together with the charges of imprisonment and sale. Um, Needless to say, all of these additional costs intended to increase uh, the uh, the period of of re-enslavement. Um, furthermore, uh, regarding the uh, the 1811 Act to prohibit the immigration of of free blacks, uh, stipulated that any free black resident of Delaware could not live outside of the state for more than six months. Uh, lest they have their residency status revoked, at which point they were subject to the very same um, penalties, uh, fines, and re-enslavement uh, as, as non-resident free blacks. Um, this, of course, is a critical blow to what is an increasingly mobile uh, free black community that is moving uh, around state to state and within Delaware itself uh, as seasonal laborers, um, and, uh, also, also in 1811 here pictured on the, uh, on the right hand side, we have the, uh, act, uh, respecting free Negroes and, and, uh, and free mulattoes. Now this act, uh, very nefarious piece of legislation here, forced any free black person convicted of theft to not only return the item that they were accused of stealing, but uh, if convicted, they were forced to pay twice the item's uh, declared value uh, by the accuser. If they could not produce the item that they were uh, 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 said to have stolen, um, then they had to pay their accuser four times the item's value. Uh, at, on top of that, uh, they were forced to pay any court fees, jail fees, and were assigned to be re-enslaved for, quote, any term not less than two nor exceeding seven years for the best price that can be obtained for him, her, or them to any person or persons whatsoever residing within this state or elsewhere. So as you can see, the 1811 Act completely circumvents uh, the 1787, 1789, and 1793 exportation laws. Um, and it is, it is important to note that anti-slavery advocates immediately recognized the myriad ways in which this law could be, and frankly was, heavily abused. So in 1816, we, uh, we have seven free black petitioners led by Robert Catlin, who petitioned the House to repeal the 1811 Act. Catlin and these other petitioners declared that the 1811 Act was, quote, oppressive and contrary to the spirit of the free constitution and the power of the government of this state. 
And they argued that as a result of this, uh, a free black person could be sold, quote, to a Southern Negro trader or his agent for a theft by them committed to the amount of even one cent where the miserable culprits will be carried perhaps 500 to 1,000 miles, separated from all their connections, and sold by the trader, no doubt, for life. They also highlighted the difficulties that any free black person would have uh, um, to, quote, pr pr uh, procure or obtain any, any evidence that would free them uh, after they had served the no, what, what was, you know, no less than two, no more than seven years of, of re-enslavement. And, and as a result, these uh, 16 free black petitioners argued uh, that this um, relegated Delaware's free black community to, quote, the most cruel slavery for many generations. And on top of these laws, uh, on top of these 1811 laws, uh, we've got in, in 1798, uh, it's uh, ruled that any uh, free black person found in a town on voting day was fined $2 and imprisoned for 48 hours or until the payment of the fine. Um, that is unless they fit a, uh, a very narrow definition of, of being on urgent business. Um, of course, uh, gun ownership for free blacks was out of the question without applying for and receiving an expensive license. Um, so so it, it, it really was an increased uh, legislative assault on the, on the rights of free blacks throughout the, uh, the early, the early uh, 19th century. And uh, after, after 1830, the, the Nat Turner Rebellion in neighboring Virginia uh, really ratcheted up the fears of free black uh, Delawareans in the mind of the white pro-slavery uh, Delawarean. And, and it's important to know that fear uh, of free black Delawareans um, that was harbored by the, by the white pro-slavery Delawareans um, really re was closely related to their knowledge of, of, uh, of violent uprisings and, uh, and calls for the, uh, the passage of laws regulating um, and restricting the rights of free blacks uh, often correlated uh, with the Haitian Rebellion, which began in 1790, uh, Prosser's Planned Rebellion in 1800, uh, Denmark Vesey's Planned Rebellion in, in 1822, and most importantly, the uh, the success of the Nat Turner Rebellion in, in 1831. Um, now, in response to the Nat Turner Rebellion in Delaware, uh, the uh, uh, white legislators passed uh, a law that required any uh, preachers, any free black preachers, to be licensed by the state and criminalized any religious gathering of a group larger than, than 12 free black people with no less than the threat of fines and re-enslavement. So these, these oppressive laws uh, which were, were fueled in, in, in part by fear of uh, free blacks. They pushed free black Delawareans to the fringes of contemporary society, of their contemporary society and, and proved to them that they indeed inhabited uh, a very different Delaware from the state's white inhabitants. The ostracization of free blacks uh, tragically made them prime targets for nefarious kidnappers, which were often called Georgia men or Carolina traders. Now, these kidnappers are most famously embodied in the, um, in Delaware at least, as in the, uh, in the Cannon Johnson gang. And uh, the Cannon Johnson gang, um, headed by Patty Cannon, Martha Patty Cannon, uh, and, her, and her partner Joe Johnson, uh, they violently assaulted and re-enslaved countless free blacks throughout the mid-Atlantic, and they quietly hustled them through their base of operations, which was strategically positioned on the Delaware and Maryland border. Um, and they hustled them through there into the, into the growing cotton south. So the Cannon Johnson gang, as they are known to historians, operated what, uh, what historian Carol Wilson referred to as, quote, probably the largest kidnapping ring in the country. And Martha, or Patty Cannon and Joe Johnson were appeared to be the, the boogeymen incarnate uh, to both free and enslaved blacks, as, as well as uh, anti-slavery-minded white uh, residents of the state. And uh, 
Patty Cannon was described by one contemporary lawyer and, and politician as, quote, that fiend in human shape. Now, it's important to note that when it comes to the Cannon and, and Johnson gang, that her the, the notorious exploits of the gang are, are quite difficult to disentangle from the myth that surrounds them. And this is due in, in large part to the publication in, in, in 1841 of the narrative confessions of Lucretia P. Cannon, which was a very sensationalized pamphlet um, that, uh, that I mean, it also, I mean, to be fair, her, her, her life is rather sensational because of the fact that she died in a jail cell awaiting trial, um, allegedly, you know, took poison to escape the hangman's noose. Um, it, 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 is a, it is a rather, you know, sensational, sensational story. Um, however, these, the Cannon Johnson gang were not just sensationalized boogeymen but truly were a, a syndicate of very real kidnappers that, that posed a terrifying threat to free and enslaved black people throughout the, the Delmarva Peninsula, the, broadly the Mid-Atlantic region. Um, and uh, I've, there's, there's one particularly horrific tale of kidnapping that, that I would like to convey to you that I've put together using uh, contemporary newspaper accounts. So on the morning of July 14th, 1821, the Sussex County Sheriff dispatched two deputies to recover three kidnapped blacks. As they approached the farm of Joe Johnson, the alleged kidnapper, deputies Miles Tyndall and Purnell Johnson announced their intent. As they yelled to Joe to come peaceably, Joe defiantly, res defiantly responded that he intended to, quote, shoot any person who attempted to enter the house or to arrest him. After a little parley, Johnson realized that the officers were determined, quote, at all risks to have him. Now, not willing to hazard his life in a shootout with the posse that laid siege to his farmhouse, Johnson surrendered. Deputies Purnell and Tyndall, along with three other constables, restrained Johnson and his compatriots and searched the house for the three kidnapping victims that they were set out to find. And as they combed the house for 55-year-old Thomas Carlyle, nine-year-old Nakra Griffith, and his four-year-old brother Isaac, the lawmen stumbled upon a wretched scene. They discovered their three victims, quote, and ten others, all confined in the house, and some of them in irons, awaiting the arrival of a vessel for transporting them to some of the southern states. A contemporary newspaper account noted uh, that local law enforcement had indeed long been aware of Johnson's activities uh, in the state and beyond. According to one article, quote, he generally went prepared for action, uh, wrote the Eastern Gazette on July 23rd, 1821. But on this occasion, quote, he was taken by surprise. Both free and enslaved black people, mostly teenage boys and girls, uh, comprised the remaining 10 victims. And the gang had reportedly kidnapped six of the 13 from Baltimore, Maryland, three from Wilmington, Delaware, and Perhaps most surprisingly, they had legally purchased the remaining four uh, from other slaveholders within the state of Delaware. Now, this graphic story put together from, from various local newspaper accounts shows that although there were these interstate trafficking laws in, in place, that these laws were very often flaunted. And indeed, uh, Joe Johnson was once uh, convicted of, uh, of interstate trafficking, uh, also in the 1820s, and was, uh, he was convicted, uh, whipped, pilloried, um, but the, the soft part of his ear, the cutting of the soft part of his ear was remitted, uh, at least according to a contemporary account. Um, so to close, to close my talk today, oh, uh, these are some fantastic further readings. Uh, if you're interested in, in, uh, reading more about, um, the kidnapping of free blacks, uh, R Richard Bell's stolen, uh, and Carol Wilson's Freedom at Risk are absolutely wonderful places to start um, uh, if you are if you are curious and want to learn uh, and want to learn more. So to, to close to close the talk today, I think that, that one important takeaway is is this that well while white Delawareans may have acknowledged the immorality of slavery and also supported the passage of laws and meant to reduce slavery's growth and impact throughout the 1780s and 1790s, many white Delawareans also sought to dictate the narrow definition 
of what black freedom meant within the state. And the, the laws that, that were subsequently passed, uh, as I hope I have shown uh, in this talk, uh, throughout this talk, indeed had a dire impact on uh, the rights of, of free blacks, uh, as well as limiting their mobility. Uh, and it really, truly did shape the way that they experienced their freedom within the state of Delaware. I would, uh, I would like to end today's talk with a, with a final quote from, from William H. Yates, the, uh, the formerly enslaved reporter for the American Anti-Slavery Society. We, uh, we started with Yates. Why, why, why not end with Yates? Um, so in, in, eight, in Yates's 1837 report, back to, back to the beginning, uh, Yates summarized the impact of, of Delaware's laws on the, on the free black community like this. He said, or he wrote, quote, the system of laws which has been adopted contains some noble and just provisions, but its general scope and design seems rather to have been to degrade, to crush, and to render them ignorant and powerless. Indeed, it has been anything but humane, benevolent, or liberal. Thank you very much for, uh, for joining us today. A uh, big thank you again to, uh, to Delaware's Historical and Cultural Affairs uh, for bringing us this wonderful opportunity. Um, and uh, please, by all means, this is my contact information here uh, on the left-hand side of the screen. Feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, I would love to, to talk, recommend sources, clarify anything that I, that I might have said. Um, and uh, please feel, feel free to, to, to shoot me an email. Um, and thank you again. Uh, once again, thank you for your, for your time today. Um, enjoy the, uh, the rest of your day. Thank you very much.